This season of The Intersection could not have been made without Google. More specifically, Google Docs, Google Mail, Google Maps, Google Scholar, Google News, Google Books, Google's YouTube, Google Bikes, and Google Search. These products were integral to the production of this podcast. But to be clear, I received no financial support from Google. In fact, they refused to talk to me. The views expressed by their employees and subcontractors are their own and do not represent the views of Google. And now, a new episode of The Intersection. Google's presence in Mountain View is, is simply so strong that it can't be the fortress that shuts away nature, that shuts away the, the neighbors. It really needs to become a neighborhood in Mountain View. In 2015, Google released a video that brought to life their vision for North Bayshore, the neighborhood where they're headquartered. I remember seeing the promotional videos that Google had produced for its new headquarters, and it was just this futuristic, otherworldly, imaginative development of a company that is so forward-thinking. And what went through your head? I thought, wow. And, and then I also thought, that's really close to the bay. And I knew it was an area that was at risk. Welcome back to The Intersection. In this mini episode, we're focusing on a topic so large and global that it may seem unrelated to our little dot on the map. But we can't ignore a rising sea and a warming planet, especially as Google and the city put the finishing touches on a housing and development plan for this corner and neighborhood. And neither can Kevin Stark. I'm an environment and energy reporter, and I write about the environment and sea level rise and climate change. For the past couple of years, Kevin's been working with the San Francisco Public Press on a series of investigative reports about how sea level rise may threaten mega developments around the Bay, including projects proposed by Google for North Bayshore. While I am curious about what he's learned, we begin with a quick primer on climate change. So what is sea level rise? Uh, so sea level rise is a phenomenon that's happening because our world is, is warming and glaciers are melting and they're adding more water into the oceans and it's causing the level of, of the oceans around San Francisco and also the bay to, to rise. Most people think of it like an ice cube melting in a drink where it's like there's a certain amount of water and uh, it's just going to melt and rise in a linear fashion. And the way that it actually works is much harder to predict. Sea level rise is very complicated science. Um, the state just published a new report on how to, to grapple with the new science that's telling us the ice sheets are melting faster than we thought and could contribute more flooding than we thought. And the state has started to present the idea of something called managed retreat. It's areas that you just know the flooding will be bad enough or there isn't enough infrastructure there that you really want to hold on to the site that you slowly start encouraging developers to move away. Now with the North Bay Shore site, I don't know if you would do something like that because it's such valuable uh, real estate. It's in such a prime location. This is where the threat of sea level rise converges with the realities of the Bay Area's housing market. Everybody all of a sudden wants to live close to the water for obvious reasons. It's such a great resource to have. It's beautiful. And it's also where a lot of the available land was, you know, old industrial areas. And we're taking advantage of that because we need more housing. And so How does the housing crisis, you think, play into this? And the I, I think about this so much because it's uh, this short-term, very acute problem we're dealing with in that housing is so expensive here and we need new housing and we need to, to depressurize the market because it's just hard for everyone. Everybody feels that. And then the other side to that is we do have land around the bay that was industrial that is great for development. And it seems like an easy solution to our problem is like we just build a lot of housing in these places, but these areas could flood. So the question would be, can you deal with your housing issue at the same time protecting against rising sea levels in the future? Um, it's a fascinating debate. This is not the first time Mountain View's considered the untapped potential of its waterfront in North Bayshore. Bob Lawrence remembers the first time he saw it after he became the city's head of planning. So I came here in 1962. One of the first things that impressed me, I remember, is, my God, this, this, this place 
has a shoreline, has a, has a water frontage, but nobody seemed to be aware of it or, or care about it or anything like that. We did think a lot about the possibility of having people live out there. In fact, we even designed kind of a neighborhood for out there. But we sort of discarded that because of the flooding possibilities. We didn't even think about rising sea levels because we weren't thinking about climate change in those days. But we knew that with a storm and a high tide, there, was, there wasn't much to keep water out of just flooding in that whole area. So we thought having an open space would be really good to accommodate any flooding and could still be beautified or made useful for human beings to uh, recreate. And that was the beginning of the plan to build what became Shoreline Park. One key selling point of the ambitious project was that the park would be built atop tons of garbage trucked in from San Francisco. This would raise the area along the bay 20 feet and reduce the likelihood of flooding. Now, more than 50 years later, the city is once again thinking about housing in North Bayshore. In this case, it's a lesser of two evils, because currently, approximately 20,000 people work in North Bayshore, and more than 19,000 of them commute in. So the city is on the cusp of allowing developers to build nearly 10,000 units of housing in the neighborhood, hoping it will help alleviate this area's horrendous traffic. The rub with that is how do we do that in a way that we can make sure it's sustainable in the future and not a place that could be potentially um, underwater? The city, Google, and potential developers are thinking about it, and the city has issued guidelines for building close to the shore, which I review with Kevin. It says here, levees should be designed to provide adequate freeboard and should not experience geotechnical failure during the the 1% annual chance coastal flooding. Um, They're already talking about levees, which is just interesting to think about when you're building a new neighborhood and you know that you're going to need to protect it by a a levee. What's Uh, a levee and why is that weird? A levee is like a, it's a seawall. I think the most classic example of American seawalls is like around New Orleans. And uh, it's just weird because it, is 100% effective until it's 100% ineffective. So levees work until they flood, and then they totally don't work. And if you're looking out in the very long term, if the bay is just going to continue to rise, and we have projections that go out to 2150, and uh, you're going to have to just keep adding to that levee or design it in a different way. Uh, A great example of that would be Treasure Island, which will be an entirely levee-protected community. And the developer there told me he could see a day in which, you know, you're standing at the on the ground level of the site, and you're looking at a levee that's above your head. And um, what, Wait, whoa, 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 what do you mean? You would be at ground level, and you would be looking at a wall uh, instead of looking at the beautiful, tremendous bay. Now, something like North Bay Shore, the devil is in the details. How high do you raise it? What science are you basing that on? The problem is the pace at which the science is developing is exceeding the rate in which we're building. And... There's projects that when we first started reporting on this back in 2012 and 2013 were just getting underway that now are getting to the point where they're ready to break ground. And they were basing their projections off of science that was developed in 2012. And we know that science now is already really outdated. Sea level rise is is happening faster. And and, um, what developers have to think about is, is this the right place to build? For how long do we want to be occupying this, this place? And who are we putting there? Do they know? Are they prepared to to take on this issue in the future? And who's going to pay for it? You don't want to be the person that buys a home that 20 years down the road is on the hook for for flooding or gets caught with a mortgage that they can't pay off because they can't sell the site because it's flooding. Like that's That's not a solution that you want. From what you're seeing here and what you know, are they being cautious in what they're doing here? Are they being cautious enough? Uh, it, it, what I can see here is that they have done an analysis of how the area would be impacted, which is important to know. And then it looks like they have a plan for how to adapt for that. And they have a funding mechanism for doing some, some improvements in the future. Um, I have seen other reports that have had more significant adaptation measures included. Um, I don't see a lot of details about the exact science that they're using, um, Maybe I can speak more generally. I, I don't necessarily want to rip North Bayshore because it looks like they have put some money and time into this. But 
generally, what I hope that we see is developments that have that kind of relationship with the bay where they're they are existing with the water, where it's not an armament of the, the shoreline, but it's more a creative and interesting and exciting ecosystem where we can recognize that this is happening and still function within it. So it's maybe not just seawalls, but we design our buildings so that the first floor or the second floor can flood. Yeah, maybe there's a parking lot on the first and second floor. So if we have a, a day of uh, storms and flooding that it comes in and then and then goes out and it's like a snow day on the East Coast. You know, we have to start thinking about how do we live with and exist with water in that way. On the next episode, we check out one other housing option at the corner of North Shoreline and Space Parkway. Google doesn't endorse people living in cars or living on campus. They would rather we go get an apartment somewhere. We'll meet three people who sleep in their vehicles night after night next time on The Intersection. In the meantime, want to hear more? Head to theintersection.fm and click on North Shoreline and Space Park. While you're at it, subscribe on your favorite podcast app. And if you've already subscribed and you like what you've heard, please rate us on Apple Podcasts. It really helps new listeners find us. The Intersection is a production of KALW. The theme song and music is by Eric Pearson. Special thanks to Megan Jones, Noah Arroyo, Michael Stoll, and the folks of Sullivan and Company. Projects like this don't just happen. This one was made possible with a grant from the San Francisco Arts Commission and from California Humanities, a nonprofit partner of the NEH. Until next time, I'm David Boyer, and this is The Intersection.